Let's talk diamonds, shall we? Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is a little different. We're gonna be going over diamonds, how to purchase them, buy or beware. Um, I don't normally wear glasses, uh, I usually wear contacts, but I'm trying to get used to wearing glasses again. The last time I wore glasses was like five years ago. I don't know if I like these glasses. These are just blue light glasses because I stare at a computer all day whether it's at work or I'm doing schoolwork. And there's a monitor right here, so I I also am getting a headache. It also kind of like tones down lights in here. Or a little more blue, I would say. So, um, yeah, I'm just gonna like wear them. My eye doctor also recommended I get them. Let's get right to the point. My name is Anna. I usually do beauty content here on YouTube, but I have gotten a lot of requests to talk about like how to buy diamonds and going into a jewelry store and engagement ring shopping. So if you don't know, I used to work in jewelry and fine jewelry. I worked at a corporate jewelry store and I worked at a um, local jewelry store. It was uh, interesting to say the least. Um, you do see a lot of interesting things come in and out and I'm just gonna give you the facts you know I'm not here to sway you one way or the other but this is just what I have learned I have taken courses to become certified as a diamondologist it sounds fancy it it's not fancy that's all okay <laughs> uh, it's not as fancy as it sounds so if you see a plaque on a store that says like someone's a di diamondologist it's just like they learn the basics of a diamond. I do not work in jewelry anymore, but I feel like, you know, this time of year, we're maybe looking at, you know, a Black Friday sale, or, you know, it's the holiday season, we wanna get engaged and stuff, and uh, I'm here for you. I have a three-page outline that I typed up in my own time, like in my freaking free time. So, where to start? First off, you gotta ask yourself, what are you looking for? If you are somebody who's looking for an engagement ring, kind of get that in mind. Like, what are you looking for, you know? Because as a jewelry, I never mind, I never minded this, okay? But there are a lot of sales associates that don't like when you're just looking. And I don't, it's like, you gotta chill out. Chill out, girl. You also have to determine what your budget is. Because I, one of the stores I worked at, I will not mention, because I am not that kind of person. Um, they will not consider your budget always. They are always gonna try and upsell you. Even if it's like 500 bucks, a thousand bucks. I was never the kind of person to like really push the limit on that. And so you really need to set in stone a budget. That is key. You need to do that before you go in the store, okay? If you don't know a budget, look on webs look on like you know different jewelry stores um websites before going into the store okay hi yeah future me coming in here talking about budget i got a question here from my instagram if you haven't followed me on instagram go follow me on instagram but it says best budget yeah elegant diamond to select for an engagement ring best budget a budget there really is no best budget out there and whatever budget you have you can guarantee that your sales associate will find something absolutely beautiful. Whether it is only a couple hundred dollars or $20,000, your sales associate will find something beautiful for you. And so really, go in there with your own taste and they will help you out no matter what. Where do you go? There are so many jewelry stores out there. It's ridiculous. I know in my mall, we had four. And I didn't live in a super big city. Like, I didn't live in, like, New York. I wasn't in a suburb of New York or anything like that. So, there's a lot of competition. There's a lot going on. What are the different jewelry stores? If you're gonna go to your local mall, you're gonna see stores like Zales, K, Hellsberg, Rogers and Hollins, Fred Myers. Maybe you're gonna see a Ben Bridge. You're gonna see uh, a Riddles jewelry. You're gonna see stuff like that. So you're gonna think, oh, where do I go? Look around. I seriously, 
look around, okay? But we're gonna talk about the difference between all of them. Let's first talk about K jewelers. So you may or may not have heard if you are like maybe like a stock market follower like I am, um, I like to follow a lot of different um, stocks. And if you might have heard of Signet Jewelers and they own a bunch of different stores. So they will, they own K, they own Jared, they own Zales, and they own Piercing Pagoda. They are known for their sales. They always got a sale going on. And you know what? That's awesome. That's so cool. You know, it, you're always, you're getting the illusion you're getting a deal anyways. But overall, you're always gonna see some sort of sale going on. You're gonna see that also from Rogers and Hollins. And I did not work at Rogers and Hollins. Um, but while my time in the jewelry industry, if you work at Rogers and Hollins, don't at me. This is just my location, so don't at me. Thank you. Um, I have heard many things about them being incredibly uh, pushy and whatnot, but we will get into that later. This is just me. Uh, another one is Hellsberg Diamonds. They are owned by Berkshire Hathaway, which is a corporation owned by w um, Warren Buffett. We also have the more luxury ones. We got Cartier, we got Tiffany, you know, stuff like that. But if you're just like an everyday, like working class consumer, hey, this is what we're at today. Um, Tiffany, I feel like you're on a whole nother level. You, you got at least a $10,000 budget, if not higher. That's crazy. There are, there are differences. Uh, they will sometimes get their diamonds sourced from different places. They will have their diamonds graded from different organizations. And that is just something that we will talk about. But no, they are not all the same. They're all the same, right? So I can get one that's cheaper at um, so-and-so jewelry store, but more expensive there. What's the difference? The four C's. Now, the four C's, we have cut color. Carrot and clarity. I'm looking down because I want to make sure that I'm following everything correctly on my outline. So let's talk about cut. Now you may, that, that's just a fancy word for shape. So if you're talking to your significant other and they say what, uh, if they, what they want in terms of a shape, that's what they mean. But that's just, you know, we got round, we have princess, uh, we have oval, marquee, cushion, emerald, heart, radiant. You know, we got all these beautiful stones. So really identify what shape do I want? What what cut do I want? Uh, the most common is definitely, I would say, uh, round princess and oval. I have a princess cut. I'm not even wearing my ring. Oh, I should go get it. I'm not even wearing my, my engagement ring and I'm talking about engagement rings. What is this? But yes, my ring does have a princess cut, which is a fancy name for a square diamond. So now we're gonna get a little bit uh, in, in depth here. So color. Now you may think diamonds, they're just like, they're, they're like white, they're clear, whatever. No, actually diamonds are graded in a letter scale, starting with D and going to Z. Okay, and the origin behind that is they did not want to do A, B, or C because A, B, and C are known in other grading scales like in education and stuff. So if you get an A, that's the best. And so they wanted to kind of make it different and make it seem not so competitive in a way when they were first <laughs> learning about the, like when they were first deciding to grade diamonds like way back in the day. N through Z, I would say are pretty muddy brown yellow diamonds they're not the pretty fancy like chocolate diamonds that you see from Levion. they're not pretty like fancy yellow diamonds no they are the diamonds that are used in like technology in drill bits you're probably not going to find a diamond like that in any jewelry store uh next up we have h through l and those have more of a faint yellow warmer tone i would say um like g through i are kind of like most common, I would say, from what I've seen. Um, and then D through G are more colorless. So D is colorless. D is um, the perfection. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anywhere from like D, E, F, that is gonna be like completely colorless. Next up, we have carrot. You may have heard about this. Carrot is the size of your diamond. I really did not appreciate <laughs> what, a, what some jewelers, maybe are gonna tell you is that industry standard is a one carat. But never let somebody pressure you 
into purchasing something that you basically can't afford or anything like that because I have seen that so many times and I think it is so unethical. Maybe the industry standard is a carrot, but get whatever size you want. Get your budget. You can get a four carat. You can get a quarter carat for all it matters. And they kind of go off like a decimal system. So you may see like a 0.25 or a 0.72. That is like fractions. So like think about it like out of the decimal system, like a 0.72. That's like 72 out of 100. You know, yeah, you can get pretty much any size you want. Uh, you can customize it however you want. Um, the one that I find most, uh, I would say maybe important, is clarity. So there, these are any imperfections on the diamond. If you are purchasing a natural diamond, there will be inclusions because they come from the earth, which is how it is. There is no diamond that's gonna come out of the earth that is absolutely perfect. Okay, but what I always like to say, it's what makes your diamond special. <laughs> so, starting off, they, the, the grading scale from this goes from FL, which stands for flawless, to I3, which is technically called the worst. I1 through I3 can be considered included, and these are imperfections that you can see with the naked eye. These can be anything from like carbon marks, um, any kind of just like imperfection on your diamond, and you will see pictures up, of course. But you can see that with your naked eye. So you can look at your diamond and go like, oh, yep, I see that little like dark gray black carbon mark. Uh, next one is SI1 to SI2, which it means slightly included. Now these are not imperfections that you're gonna see with your naked eye. It's not something that I'm gonna look at and be like, oh yeah, I see that one right there. You know, that's not the one for you. Um, these are noticeable to a greater under 10 times magnification. So somebody like me, if I looked at a diamond under the magnification, I could see that. But maybe your average Joe who knows nothing about diamonds is not gonna be able to see it under magnification. Then it's VS1 to VS2, which means very slightly included. And now this is the kind of range you'll see at like Tiffany. Cause if you ever browse a Tiffany website, the inclusions are, are minor. I'm reading all this. I will have sources down below as well. Just saying. <laughs> the inclusions are minor and they range from difficult to somewhat easy for a skilled grader to see under 10 times a magnification. And then this, these get even harder. So they're like the, the, the higher up we're going, the more like perfect they are. So we got like VVS1 to VVS2, and that's gonna be very, very slightly included. So inclusions are difficult for a skilled grader to see under 10 times magnification. And then we have IF, which is internally flawless. So this means no inclusions or blem blemishes are visible to a skilled grader under 10 times magnification. And then we have FL, which stands for flawless. And this is no inclusions or blemishes are visible to a skilled grader under 10 times magnification. And those diamonds are so rare, okay? And now when we're talking about these kinds of grading and the colors, the higher up you're gonna go, the higher the price tag. So for example, a VS1 diamond is gonna be more expensive than an I1 diamond just because they're more rare. The less inclusions you see to the naked eye, the more rare it is. So I3 can be considered the most common, whereas flawless can be considered the most rare. In terms of color, same thing goes. I mean, you know, an I color diamond is gonna be less expensive than an E or an F. And that's just how it's gonna go because the, the more colorless the diamond is, the more rare it is. Now we got all that, I know it was probably like a WTF. Okay. I also wanted to note, if you go on Tiffany's website, you will see that if you really want like an IF Clarity Diamond D color, that's how expensive something like that is going to be. And so having more realistic expectations is key. Who decides this? Does somebody just get to come in and be like, okay, this is an I1? No. Okay, there are different grading scales. There's, first off, GIA, which stands for the Gemological Institute of America. 
and this is the most reliable and is considered the standard bearer for of the diamond certification industry. I got this off a website. I'm going to link it down below for you. I'm reading off the sheet. <laughs> I would definitely recommend looking for a skill for a jeweler that does go with that grading scale. It's just going to be the most beneficial to you and they're known to be the most accurate. They are known to be the, the standard in the diamond industry. Wouldn't you want something like that? Um, next is AGS, which is the American Gem Society, and that's the second most reliable. So in terms of the American Gem Society, grades tend to be slightly looser, meaning the diamond maybe one to two grades off from what it truly is. Say the American Gem Society decided to grade a diamond at an I-1, the Gemological Institute of America may have graded at an I-2 or an I-3. Okay, or they may grade it at an SI2 or an SI1, depending. Next one is the EGL, which is the European Gemological Laboratory. Now this is not very prominent in the US. You're probably not gonna see it a whole lot. Um, I have seen one diamond that was very inaccurately graded from the e from EGL and it was really bad. They were saying it was like a G in color, but it looked more like a K. It was pretty darn yellow. It's not reliable by any means. Uh, another one is IGI, which is the International Gemological Institute. And they are known for their very lax grading standards, and they can be as far up as three grades from GIA certifications. The corporate jewelry store I worked at, um, they did use IGI. And working at, a at the non-corporate jeweler, um, they did GIA certifications. There were definitely differences in the diamond quality and you could see that the grading was evidently more accurate. Um, when I started my corporate job, I didn't know really anything about diamond grading or anything. When I started, I thought, okay, yeah, this is it. And then I went to the non-corporate jewelry, jewelry store and I was like, like their grading is definitely a lot different. And I would say if you're gonna look for a store, go somewhere that is GIA certified. Now let's get into the juicy topic. Lab grown versus natural diamonds. This is a topic that I used to be very uh, interested in. I used to be very, uh, like I, it was almost like my research topic. Like if I was a PhD student, I would research this stuff. And I love, I love learning about this kind of topic. I love learning about diamonds and gemstones in general. So let's talk about what are natural diamonds? Well, we, ta we touched on it a little bit earlier, but they are diamonds that are mined from the earth. And a question that may, you may think of, or you may have no idea about, are blood diamonds. And you think, okay, so are all natural diamonds blood diamonds? Absolutely not. There's something called the Kimberly process. And this particular jewelry store that I worked at the, was a part of the Kimberly process. And so it was established in 2003 to prevent conflict diamonds, which are another term for blood diamonds from entering the mainstream rough diamond market by the United Nations General Assembly resolution. Basically, that being said, most jewelers, including the non-corporate jeweler that I worked for, were all abiding by the Kimberly process. They were all sourcing, they were all getting diamonds, sellers and whatnot, that all came from corporations that abided by this. So you are gonna be so hard pressed to find a blood diamond in the United States of America. And being that this is part of the United Nations, a lot of other countries have abided by this policy. So they are not very common at all. You're not gonna see it if you're in America. You know, there are so many laws and policies also that have prevented conflict diamonds from coming to our shores in the first place. Um, a lot of mining sources for natural diamonds have actually created a lot of job opportunities for communities in African countries where diamonds are mainly mined from. A lot of diamonds nowadays, it's almost like a feel good thing that you're providing jobs and whatnot in good working conditions for these people in um, African countries, which is awesome. Let's talk about lab grown diamonds. It was some, this is something that I'm gonna be real straightforward with you, I do not like. And if you have a lab grown diamond, I am not hating on you by any means. This is just my research, my education that I have received to show that you're better off buying a natural diamond. And I'm gonna share that with you. So lab-grown diamonds, what are they? They're diamonds that are produced in a lab. 
uh, lab-grown diamonds are manipulated in a lab, in a reactor, to have a higher clarity and color. So keep in mind that I said reactor, because they are put in a reactor to be able to be grown. You know, they are manipulated, so they are gonna have a higher color. They're gonna be more towards your G, F, E, maybe even D, and they're gonna be more like VS1, VVS2, because they can be manipulated like that because they're in a lab versus maybe the natural diamond that you're being shown in the store may be an H color and an SI2. A test as a diamond. So diamond, there are testers out there that can test your diamond to make sure it's real or not. And lab-grown diamonds test as a diamond. Trained eye can see a difference, but you probably can't, okay? Until a, a sales associate points it out to you. What I see is I see almost like a grayish hue. Like they're almost like, have like a darker center. I don't know how to print, how to like describe it. Let's talk about value of diamonds because lab grown diamonds are going to be less expensive right now than natural diamonds. They're gonna be promoted as an eco-friendly, approach to diamonds because um, I have seen sales techniques and I have been in situations where I have like secret shopped <laughs> and I have had sales associates tell me that, you know, these are eco-friendly diamonds and, and that mine diamonds are bad for the earth. And okay, let's talk, let, let's, un let's unbox that because I, okay, eco-friendly, but they are put into a reactor. Yes, you are digging into the earth to get mine to get natural diamonds but there are companies that are rebuilding that land they are replanting everything after that mine is has been extinguished and so you so with that being said not all mine diamonds are bad for the earth by any means. So do not let somebody fool you into thinking that, okay? Long-term value. Lab-grown diamonds are going to decrease in value over time. Now, I heard a study from one of the places I worked at that said, um, since lab-grown diamonds came out about four years ago, their value has decreased by 40% already. That's a lot. Let's say you bought a lab-grown diamond in 2016 for $10,000, okay? You bought like a two and a half carat, you bought a big one. Today it's probably only worth about $6,000. So if you were to get insurance and everything, which I will talk about, your value is gonna be decreasing. Whereas, the, it, it's almost like, do you guys remember when the iPhone first came out and it was like $1,000? And now look at that first iPhone. What's it worth, like 10 bucks? Think about a microwave. You, like when microwaves came out, they were like $500. Now you can get one for like 40 bucks. So really, these can be considered like a tech product because they're all tech, like, oh, it's lab grown, like it's so fun and fresh and they're decreasing in value faster than ever. Think about like a big flat screen TV. Remember when those used to be super expensive? I, my fiance and I bought a like 48 inch TV for like 200 bucks like two years ago. That's something to really think about and that's not what a lot of sales associates are going to tell you. Sales associates are told to sell certain products, to really focus on a certain product and there are stores out there that will focus on lab grown diamonds and they will tell you that. If you really wanna know um, more, I would recommend also doing your own research on top of this video. Natural diamonds are gonna keep their value long term. They are, this is a product that does not decrease in value. It's pretty much the same, stays pretty accurately that you've had for 20 years. So let's just say my ring, it appraises for, let's just say it appraises for $6,000. It was not $6,000. Let's just say it appraises for $6,000 right when I get it. 10 years later, I'm gonna get an updated appraisal for my insurance. It's probably gonna stay around the same because I'm not an appraisal specialist, I'm not an appraiser, but I do know that natural diamonds do not lose their value. I know this through my own research through the Gemological Institute of America. Out there, TC guidelines. 
the Federal Trade Commission. If you live in America, um, these are some guidelines surrounding lab-grown diamonds. A salesperson cannot call a lab-grown diamond a real diamond because it's not considered a real diamond. You know, they also, they're not natural, but they're not considered real diamonds according to the FTC. Now we've unpacked that. What's next? You're in the jewelry store and you're thinking, should I purchase my diamond separately from my mounting? And if you're wondering, what's a, what's a mounting? The mounting is gonna be the thing holding your ring. We got your center stone right here. This is good. Everything around it is the mounting. And if it's a purchasing that, doing that separately, is having your own customization. You can do it however you want. You can pick out what kind of gold you get. And it's fun. It really is. You know, and I have sold, um, you know, diamonds separately from the mounting. That's great, okay? But the drop, some of the drawbacks are, it's gonna be really hard to picture everything because the way it's set up, you need a jeweler to really encase that stone in your mounting. So you're not really gonna be able to get a clear idea. So if you're shopping with your significant other and they're trying it on, they're really not gonna get a super clear picture because you know the diamond's gonna be kind of like loose in there. And I always found that kind of annoying when I was doing that because I would, you know, place the diamond with the tweezers, you know, diamond tweezers, and I would be like setting it in, in the mounting, and I would, you know, be doing all that. And really, I don't know, it was a lot of people were like, oh yeah, and they didn't really get it. So another beware is that sales associates are gonna try and sell you a higher carrot because of this. You know, it, it's okay if you're in the moment, you're like, oh my God, I really, I wanna splurge on them. I wanna get them this size, even though I originally said this size, I'm gonna do it, do it. But they are trained, myself included, to get you to purchase as big of a stone as you can possibly get. And they really almost, I'm the one place I worked at, they really frowned upon doing anything less than a carrot. WTF? Like what? It's gonna be more expensive to sell your diamonds separately from your mounting. I would say the, the jewelry store that I worked at, okay, now this is not necessarily compare. Okay, this was the non-corporate jewelry store. They had very high quality diamonds and they were GIA and AGS certified. That being said, the average one carat stone did retail for $8,000, okay? The average mounting, if you were gonna get um, I like just call them side stones or diamonds along the side. Melly stones, sorry, I'm holding this. I don't know why this, sorry. I just needed something to like fiddle with, I guess. Yeah, that's gonna range anywhere from, if you get like a basic gold mounting, no diamonds, that could range from like a thousand, or you can be looking upwards of like three or 4,000 just for that mounting. And you know, putting that into perspective, like let's, it could be anywhere from 11 to $12,000. What, if you wanted like a really elaborate, kind of mounting, you know, it really adds up. It adds up fast. Whereas if you buy your ring all in one, you know, your jeweler says, this is your ring, that's it. You're really, get, you're really getting a visual of what you're gonna see. You also save a little money because you're not having like any kind of jeweler sit there and pop in a stone for you. You know, it's all right there for you. It's all good to go. Okay, that's what mine is. Here's some techniques to deal with sales associates because we've all seen the pushy sales associates. I have worked with some that are like, yeah, I try not to be like pushy. And then, and then they're over there like pushing customers. And uh, I just, you know, I am, I feel like that's why I didn't really fit in the jewelry industry because I wasn't pushy. You know, I didn't, I wanted people to feel 100% comfortable with what they were buying. And there were times where I almost got reprimanded for it. Um, so techniques that sales associates use, they wanna close that sale today. They wanna get their commission, they wanna line their wallets. They wanna do, they're gonna do anything they can to get you to buy that today. They are commission-based. Almost all jewelry stores that I know of are commission-based. They will ooh and ah you, they will put it on, they will make it sparkle. One technique I did for a guy, his girlfriend had come in and like, this was the ring that I want, I'm gonna have him come in and look at it so he can buy it for me. 
and it was so beautiful. Okay, oh my God, it was amazing. It was at the corporate jewelry store. It was the biggest ring I had sold there, okay? And I was just in awe, it was so gorgeous. It was gorgeous on her, it fit her persona. And the guy came in and was like, I don't know, like I'm really unsure, I'm a little nervous. And all I did was put it on my finger and I said, can you picture this on her? Like, look how that sparkles, and he bought it. That was a technique that I used. It wasn't pushy, but these are techniques people are gonna use to make you wanna buy today. Is that a bad thing? No. But don't ever feel like you are like obligated to um, make them happy. Chances are they have a lot of other uh, customers that are gonna come in, and they're gonna buy from them today, later today. Do not feel like you have to be the, the one to make the first their sale, okay? Do not feel that way at all. Some red flags, again, don't let them feel, being pushy. If they're gonna like, oh, let's wrap this up today, let's wrap this up today, and you're like, oh, I just need a little bit of time to think. Take your time to think, seriously. Do not let a sales associate make you feel pressured into buying anything before you are 100% ready. Just don't do it. Like, also, if you're feeling obligated, like if they're kind of making you feel obligated to, don't let them. You are in control of your moment. And you know, I have seen a lot of people just be like, oh, I don't know, and they just were really nervous and the setting was really ner like was nerve wracking for them. Go for a walk, get a coffee, relax, take a few days, take a few weeks. You decide on your own time. You are in control of your own life. And you know, they want to make sales. They are commission based. They want to earn their money. Okay, but if you're not ready to buy today, do not buy today. You will most likely have buyer's remorse. And I have seen it one too many times. And it's, it's hard. Another technique they will use. They offered me a discount to if I buy today. <laughs> okay, I personally, I'm not gonna lie, I have never used this technique. Um, have I been trained on this technique? Yes. Um, I have not used it though. The markup on jewelry. If you go to a lot of jewelry stores, there is most likely gonna be a markup, okay? The corporate jewelry store I worked at, you definitely are paying more than what it was worth. No shade to that jewelry store, it, it's awesome. It was an awesome store, but just it, know that there is, a, there is a markup. And a lot of these stores, you're gonna see a lot of the sales and like, oh my God, 25% off everything. They purposely mark the, the jewelry up to mark it down to give you the illusion that you're getting a discount. And I know that some of you are like, what? what? Like seriously, that's what they do. And I know this <laughs> because I was told this. <laughs> they literally mark it up to mark it down. So this discount that you're getting is pretty much what it's worth. Look for jewelry stores that are monitored by the American Gem Society. So only 5% of jewelers are monitored by this. So what, what does it mean to be monitored by the American Gem Society? Well, this means that there are no irrational markups on everything. You're really, like what you're paying for is the insurance value. So if I bought a ring for $2,000, I will get an insurance appraisal for $2,000. That's just how it's gonna go. You know, it prevents markup and, um, and ensures the value of the price rather than you know being like, oh God, I paid 5,000 for it, but it's only worth four, I lost money. You, you don't want anything like that, okay? And some stores that are AGS monitored are gonna be maybe some more local jewelry stores as well as Hellsberg Diamonds and uh, Tiffany. Uh, Hellsberg is gonna be the one that's maybe more like, be more in your area and whatnot. It's under, it's a company under Warren Buffett. I really do appreciate Hellsberg's uh, practices as a company. And I honestly recommend them low key, but I'm here. I'm not here to create biases by any means. And then also you shouldn't have to get an appraisal on top of purchasing a piece. You should already get an insurance form that is printed out for you. That's what happened when I got my ring. They printed me out, well they printed Logan out a, a um, insurance document to present to my insurer and it would ensure exactly for what I paid for it because that's what it's worth. Let's just say you found the piece of your dream, you love it, you know that your significant other is just going to die over it, it's everything they've ever wanted. Credit cards, every store has them. Every store is going to be sprinkling in. That is a technique 
That is literally the verbiage that one of the jewelry stores I work for used. And it was like low key annoying because you know, nothing drives me more nuts is when I go into a store, I am ready to pay and I get told about the credit card system and I say, I don't want a credit card. I don't need another credit card. They are t trained. They, you are pressured to hit a certain percentage with credit. Therefore, they sometimes may like pressure you into making you apply for a credit card. Don't ever feel pressured to apply for a credit card, okay? My, like, they are great, okay? There are some great benefits. So, interest-free financing. Uh, the corporate jewelry store that I worked at, they would offer like, you know, if you spent a certain amount of money, you get 12 months interest-free, you spend a higher amount of money, you get 18 months interest-free, and it was really great, okay? But there are drawbacks. So you get like to a year or a year and a half to like pay off your ring. That's awesome. No interest either. Amazing. So if you were to put it maybe on like your Discover card or your Amex, you're gonna see an interest charge versus if you were to go with the jewelry stores um, and, um, charging system. But there are some detrimental drawbacks that can be really life-changing, okay? Um, the interest rates are incredibly high. Any store credit card, you're gonna see an APR of like 29.99% or higher. Really, the corporate jewelry that I worked at had like a 29.99% APR, kind of standard. I saw at the non-corporate jewelry store as high as 34.99% APR. So if you spend $10,000 your APR, you would get an interest charge of about $3,500 if it were the 34.99%. It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. So if you don't pay off that card in that interest-free period, you will get a ginormous interest charge after the period ends. So let's say um, January 1st, I buy a, an engagement ring. I have 12 months to pay it off, no interest. Amazing, love it. If I don't pay it off by January 1st of the next year, I am gonna get kicked in the butt with interest charges. And that is something they may not, you know, let you know about that, but I'm here to tell you because I don't want you to get screwed over. I have seen so many people get screwed over because of that. With credit cards, I think that they are great. If you're buying, doing a big purchase and you are applying for that store credit card and you get 12, 18 months interest refinancing, that's gonna be a real helpful tool, but you really need to make sure that you're either setting up automated payments or you're making sure you're getting that paid off because I just would hate to see anybody, whether I know you or not, get screwed over like that. And you know, they'll give you a pamphlet of all the credit card information, but in terms of service and agreement and whatnot, that's all fine print. Do we really read all the fine print? No, we don't. It, honestly, with that, go at your own risk. I have seen, I have signed up people for so many credit cards while I worked at Ulta, while I worked at my jewel, the jewelry stores, okay? You know, if somebody, if you don't wanna apply for credit, be firm with that. Say, I'm not interested in credit because nothing is gonna be worse for making you just like, yep, I, I get it, I get the credit card, I get the credit card. Be firm because you wanna stand up for yourself, okay? While this is a very fun experience, you also want to say like, you know, you don't want to feel like obligated to do anything. So overall, the credit card, it's completely up to you. Go at your own risk and just know what you're going into. That is my, my overall consensus of a tip. Know what you're going into. And I'm saying this because I care about all of you watching this. So you found the ring, oh my gosh, it's great. They all, they boxed it up all beautifully. It's perfect. And now what? Get that puppy insured. Whether that is through your homeowner's insurance or through a um, specialty jewelry insurer service. What? <laughs> um, make sure you get it insured because nothing is worse than, um, you know, have you ever seen those engagement fails where they accidentally drop the engagement ring like down the gutter or off a cliff? Get it insured. Okay, um, some jewelers will give you the option to insure it through an organization that they work with. Um, but I would definitely check your rates, whether it's with your homeowner's insurance or other insurance companies, just to kind of like get, get an idea here and like, you know, what's going on. Lastly, propose! Or if you bought it for yourself, 
treat yourself. I have sold engagement, like literally engagement rings to people who have just worn them for fun, for fashion. I love that. You know what? It is um, 2020. If you want to splurge on yourself and girl get you that big ring, do it. And you know, that's awesome. And I've, I've sold to people who have done that and that's awesome. There you go. That is everything that I am sharing with you today about diamonds, about purchasing an engagement ring, about different sales techniques that people use, that jewelry sales associates will use. Know that a lot of jewelers' intent is to, you know, make you happy. But I do know that they that you also should feel comfortable when going into a jewelry store. If you have any other questions, leave them down below for me. I will be happy to answer them for you to the best of my ability. While I don't have, you know, tw I worked I've worked with people who have had 20 plus years of experience. While I don't have that, I do have a couple of years under my belt and I'm not calling myself an expert by any means. And overall, I'm just here to help you. Again, if you want to see another series, like another video on like maybe like gemstones, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I was, I've been really wanting to do this video for a while and I'm so happy I finally did it. So there you go. Um, I wish you the best of luck if you're going out engagement ring shopping, especially um, during the pandemic. Please wear a mask. Be safe. Social distance, you guys. <laughs> uh, but yes, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I'm here to have you avoid any crap. There you go, because salespeople can be crazy. They can be overbearing. They can be the best person you've ever met and that you want to go to for every special occasion. That's great too. But I do know that overall, <laughs> going into a jewelry store can be so intimidating. Okay, like I know it can be intimidating. I've been there, you guys. I, I understand. You know, it's intimidating walking into a, to an environment like that, especially when you are feeling a little clueless, a little lost. I get it. So that's why I'm here to help you. That is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to subscribe, ring the bell, give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed, and share this. If you know somebody who is in the market for an engagement ring or some diamonds, uh, send them this video. All right, you guys, I'm gonna go eat some dinner, and I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.